good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Maciej Czeka. I'm, I'm going to present a FreeBSD success story today. So uh, this time, uh, the FreeBSD system was used uh, as a data science platform on ARM64. So that is a tier one platform since uh, recently. And for those of you hasty people, I can already say, uh, I'm going to ask the question, is, it, is, it, um, is FreeBSD a good platform for, for data science? And too long didn't read, I can already say, yes, it is. So thank you for your attention and goodbye. So that was a joke, of course. So now I'm going to argue why is it a good platform? And, you know, what was my story? What was my journey? Why I did use it? Uh, what I did use it and, you know, what, what works well, what could be improved? So uh, Phil, uh, I think we're going to have um, a short Q&A uh, um, session at the um at the end because i don't think you guys can uh, chime in to, to ask me a question live so uh just short introduction of myself so i've been working at a semi-health company for over 10 years um usually doing embedded stuff usually about arm v7 and later arm v8 uh, freebsd uh, porting linux drivers um, Marvel, Marvel SOC platforms. So my company is proud, proud to put FreeBSD or anything that can be, uh, that, that has a CPU, although it must be big one. So we like big platforms like uh, Power8, Power9, AMD Epic. Um, so that's our, you know, um, that's our focus. Uh, my focus is on networking actually and on data plane. Uh, and because of that, I was doing a PhD studies uh, related to a simulation of uh, hardware equipment, uh, network hardware equipment, and my simulation, my study required doing a massive simulation experiment. So the experiment succeeded and helped me graduate, and, and FreeBSD was actually a key part of that story. So the agenda is that I'm going to shortly introduce the experiment that I was doing, uh, then describe the platform that I chose, and describe the data science stack that I was using, and then I'm going to talk about the execution, what worked well, what could have been improved, um, and the overall conclusion. So how can we use it uh, for data science? What are the challenges? Um, so the task was a massive simulation experiment. So, so I'm, I was going to simulate the network device, though it was algorithmic simulation, so no, no RTL, no hardware level. Um, the input was lots of lots of pickup files with network traces. The output was a, a, a custom event trace and statistics. Um, the technology was mostly custom software in C++ and quite a lot of Python uh, to later to process the data. Originally, I was using a prototyping on my Linux desktop, uh, but soon, um, but pretty soon, I realized that the desktop platform is not big enough. It cannot cannot handle such such scale. So I was looking for something better. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see the breakdown of the system. You, we've got the test generator um, that is producing a make file. And then we've got the two C++ application. One is the mixer. Second one is a simulator. Um, and then there is the flow database. The flow database is read by a statistical pipeline with pandas, scipy, and many others. And then we produce graphs and tables and nice looking uh, pictures. Um, now the scale was, I had more than 200 input files spanning more than 100 gigabytes of input data. Uh, again, uh, more than 200 gigabytes of output data in custom binary formats. And the number of experiments, experiments that I had to do was around 1000 to gain a statistic, statistical significance. Um, one experiment could take up up to one hour and up to 30 gigabytes of RAM. So that was on the verge of basically on the brink of not possible to run on a, on a good, even a good Linux desktop. So um, how to make it scale? Well, there are two, two ways to scale it. One is to try to expand the application to um, use multi -thre multiple threads. And the second one is to use coarse grain 
approach, meaning you leave the application as it is, but just spawn a lot of applications in parallel, hoping that um, the scaling would be close to linear. And, and in fact, it is because you know the applications don't share anything uh, between them. They use different files. So it's just a matter of IO then. Um, so that was my choice. Um, and that worked pretty well. So the platform, so if you want to scale in this manner, so the domain, the, the, if you look at the single application, it uses only one CPU core. And for one CPU core and for such a large scale experiment, the bottleneck is mostly memory latency because the memory, the working set is bigger than, than your cache. Um, so large data structures like trees and hash tables um, were used and basically it means there are, there are quite a lot of cache misses. Now for the whole system, if you try to multiply this process, providing that you have enough memory, of course, um, then the bottleneck becomes, then the memory bandwidth become, becomes a bottleneck because one CPU core could consume several gigabytes per second. And then if you scale it to many cores, it's a, it's a widely widespread knowledge uh, about in, in among in scientific community that the CPUs are designed in such a manner that one one CPU can easily consume let's say 20 gigabytes of bandwidth, but the overall system has 100 or 200 gigabytes of bandwidth. So if you have multi heavily multi-core system, then you quickly running out of bandwidth. So basically, the system bottleneck is mostly memory bandwidth. Um, my wish list was uh, basically lots of RAM. Many CPUs, although it's not the most critical part, the RAM is the most critical. And the bigger the L3 cache is, the better, because then you, you cut the latency to the main memory. So it happened that uh, back then we had a Thunder X2 ARM V8 platform in our lab. So the platform was used for FreeBSD and development. Um, it's got, it's got two sockets. Uh, each socket is as uh, 28 cores. Uh, it's four-way multi-threaded. I mean, four-way SMT, but uh, but we haven't been using uh, multiple threads on one core. It's, it doesn't, be, this, this kind of experiment doesn't benefit from it. So it was turned off. Uh, quite a lot of L3 cache. So um, around one megabyte of L3 cache per core. The cache is distributed uh, in a cluster, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, the cross-section bandwidth on the L3 cache was huge, so it was six terabyte per second. And there was H-channel DRAM, DRAM controller. Each socket had its own DRAM, DRAM controller. Uh, so the total bandwidth was 200 gigabytes per second, which is quite a lot even for today's standard. So that experiment was done. Um, roughly two years ago, but even today is quite a lot. And some, you know, some, for instance, some Intel Xeon systems has, have less than that in benchmarks. So, um, so the interconnect bandwidth, you can see that it's smaller than the overall DRAM bandwidth. So it's actually much more beneficial to use local DRAM, not to share data between sockets. But in my case, if there, this is a trivial parallelism because each thread is using its own or each, each application is using its own data. So that wasn't the problem. And so I'm using FreeBSD 12.2 and the storage system was ZF, ZFS backed and that was a SSD, a SSD storage. Um, my, my stack except for C++, which was fairly standard using only one C++ library except for um, standard library. So C++ was not a challenge, but I had a pretty huge data science stack. So I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know it or not, but basically Python is, uh, is like a go-to solution for scientists who cannot afford MATLAB, <laughs> I would say, or don't want to use MATLAB for some reasons. So basically pretty much most of the functionality can be reproduced by uh, by free tools, uh, open source tools like NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib. So NumPy is the basic um, math algebra library. Then there is a SciPy and Scikit-Learn. These are statistical tools and some machine learning tools. Matplotlib is for creating uh, graphs, very pretty nice looking graphs. Uh, 
Pandas is for um, online, is for in-memory databases, very good for statistical analysis, provided that your data set fits in RAM, uh, which was my case, actually. Um, Jupyter Notebook is just an engine that grabs all of this together and produces interactive graphs. Uh, it's very good for uh, presenting the research or experimenting. Um, so you can see there are quite a lot of dependencies. There are tens or even hundreds of packages and each package requires its own, its own version. So it quickly becomes a dependency house. So uh, the, you know, it's, it's such an issue that uh, it deserves its own XKCD comic, which you can see on the right hand side here. So, um, so basically, deployment of such a, uh, of uh, of such stack is quite a quite a challenge. So, first of all, you shouldn't be using any OS package manager. So, FreeBSD ports contain some of those packages, but usually there are version conflicts. If you if some of the packages some of the packages are not part not part of the port then you're usually you have little luck to find the right version in the port so so it's a bad idea a bad idea you have you gotta use something else like for instance pip which is python packet manager uh, so pip can create its own uh, package tree but is then not traced by freebsd uh, port system so pip has a virtual env uh, which is a, a kind of a jail for python so basically you create your separate package tree just for your own uh, sake and it's uh, you know not interconnected with the system to some extent so for instance if your tool requires python 3.9 and your system is running python 3.6 they can coexist in this manner uh, the issue is that some of the packages are still shared and the rest of the system is obviously shared. Um, so for, for Linux and Windows and MacOS users, there's Anaconda, which is a binary distribution for all of this um, because most of the packages have to be actually compiled. They are in source version. Um, but uh, the problem with Anaconda is that the company running it is not, hasn't been interested in porting it to FreeBSD so far. Uh, now, the second option, apart from virtual and was uh, containers. So looking, but uh, retrospectively looking, that was the best option. I didn't took it. I was kind of thinking that perhaps I could dodge it and make it simpler. No, 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 I want, I couldn't make it simpler at the end. Um, so the dilemma is that, you know, the Python and the virtual env it worked eventually, but it costed me quite a lot of hassle. So source packages, Python has source packages. What I mean by that is most Python, um, most Python packages are just thin wrappers around some C library or, or basically they're implemented mostly in C with exposed uh, interface to C Python. Um, and some of those packages required GCC explicitly, couldn't work with Clang. Uh, some of the packages assumed some directory paths that were related to Linux or x86, so I had to tweak it. Uh, so not every package is completely isolated from the system. Um, so anytime you upgrade the system, upgrade the, your base FreeBSD system, you risk breaking the dependencies. So that was um, that was pretty painful. So that that's why I saying in I'm saying in the retrospective that that was not a good choice for me. So the conclusion is that uh, using a jail is actually a must if you have such a complex stack, especially using Python or any other tool that is also used by the system. Uh, we should be striving to keep our development environments in a container. So that is not so, not a surprise for, um, for people actually. I can just repeat that common wisdom. Um, and upgrade only when you must because then you risk losing and break or breaking the dependencies. So also we got to keep the container in a backup um, in case something doesn't work. And we shouldn't be chasing the latest API, although it's sometimes it's tempting. Uh, we should try not to use it because it's always the risk. So, you know, it's this, this kind of dependency situation is actually less, uh, less major. So this package management is less major than the standard OS package management. So upgrading is actually much more riskier than, uh, much more risky than uh, upgrading the base system sometimes. Um, so that was the most difficult part because of no native 
Python binary packages for uh, for FreeBSD. Now porting C++ wasn't an issue. It took me around one day. So as long as your application is POSIX compliant, you have only you have, you have nothing to do pretty much. So I had to do minor API tweaks just to make sure my system calls are POSIX compliant, not Linux specific. A Clang compliance is usually not an issue. It actually is even better when your code compiles by two compilers because then you have more warnings discovered. Uh, so more undefined, undefined behavior discovered. Um, there were minor performance differences between standard library under Linux and standard library for C++ in FreeBSD, but that was mostly around IOStream. And the IO stream is honestly not the best tool to the, for the job. When you have lots of IO, you should be using binary, binary IO and avoid and avoid IO stream in the first place. So that was my my mistake. I, I would say to use some text-based IO in the beginning. Um, so standard compliance pays off as long as your code is kept portable and your code, your code quality actually is even better. So I discovered a couple of bugs doing this porting. Uh, I eliminated some undefined behavior. Um, it was simpler than installing the Python stack actually. So um, of course I had to switch to low level IO to make sure that my, my application is fast enough. Uh, and make sure that C, the, uh, we, even though I was using C++, I was trying to use C structures anytime I had to serialize the data to the disk. Uh, so what about ARM64? So this talk was supposed to be about ARM64 and I'm never mentioning, mentioning anything about ARM64. It wasn't an issue. And the answer is no. That's why I'm not mentioning. So you know, you know there's a famous saying about IT admins. So a good IT admin is the one that has nothing to do, right? Because the system is working fine and doesn't have to uh, put down fires. So the same is with ARM64. So the stability of, the, of this platform is so good that I just, it becomes just invisible. So you can use it and you just forget about it that it's some, some kind of non-standard platform. So as long as your code is portable, no issues. The recompilation is frictionless. The ARM64, most of the platforms are little in the end, so you reduce the chance of, of ABI issues uh, anyway. And actually the ABI is pretty much similar to x86 because the, the sizes of integers is the same, uh, structure layout is the same. So even in the case of some, you know, of some problem, the risk of making something wrong is actually quite small. Now there could be challenges in multi in multi-threaded applications. We've seen that in our experience uh, at SemiHealth, uh, but my application wasn't really multi-threaded, so that that part was excluded, luckily for me. Um, and so anyway, uh, I can conclude on that that FreeBSD ARM64 is just an invisible platform for you, so it runs just like any other FreeBSD. It's truly three-year one. It just works, so you don't have to worry about it. You can use it at Amazon, for instance. Now they have pretty nice, you know, ARM64 instances in there. Uh, how about the execution? So uh, my principal guideline, but after you know having such a hassle with Python stack. My principal guidance was no more software, no more installing, trying to use as much standard tools as possible. Uh, so I use basically a makefile as a, my uh, pipeline, uh, data pipeline system, right? So makefile should be fine for that. Um, so my primary, uh, my primary um, um, let's say process that was running the experiment was actually two processes. My primary job was just two processes joined by a pipe, followed by a Python script, right? It took quite a lot of RAM. You can see on the right-hand side that my spawn processes consume here. Some of them consume, you know, 20 gigabytes of RAM. Some of them consume up to 40 uh, gigabytes of virtual memory alone. And the, the 40 gigabyte was actually a Python script, not, not the simulator itself. Um, um, and there are many processes, but the CPU load, this is actually half of the HTOP command. So that was an, an HTOP screen, but this is half of the screen. Second half has the, the another 28 processors. Um, so you see that the, I'm using all RAM, but the processor are not uh, fully saturated. 
Um, so, but the, there was an issues with job make server, not related to FreeBSD, but to make itself and to other build systems that could be used as a data, uh, as a data pipeline. So basically, your minus J option and your job server is very is really fine when your building or processing workload is CPU bound. But as but when it becomes DRAM bound, when when it becomes uh, limited by the amount of memory, then you're out of luck. There's no switch for that, and there's no no way to monitor it. So, for instance, you can monitor CPU load with the make um, utility, but you can't monitor DRAM consumption. And actually, other build systems have the same issue. So they can't monitor RAM pressure. They they can just monitor CPU load. So what to do about it? Well, um, the FreeBSD system actually helped me with that. So the first principle here was to embrace the failure. So I had to admit that sometimes my experiment, one instance of the experiment could fail because there is not enough RAM. I couldn't predict how much RAM would a particular experiment take and how many experiments I could run in parallel until I ran out of memory. Uh, it wasn't predictable. So what I do is I was allowed the OEM killer to do the job for me, uh, provided that I lose some CPU time. Like ultimately I could use like one hour of CPU time if at the very end the experiment could be killed. So the job server basically it works like this. So OEM killer detects that there is an issue with memory. So once the FreeBSD kernel wants to allocate new pages, it tries to um, move pages to the swap if they're swappable, but if there are active pages, not, not uh, so constantly used or dirty, they're not, uh, they're not moved to the swap. Um, so there, there must be other way to do it, right? So uh, there's a controversial strategy which says kill the biggest process. And this way you, you gain as much memory as you can and repeat this process. There's a famous, uh, very funny passage in the FreeBSD source code. I, I recommend reading vm underscore uh, page out dot C. There is a, there is a passage after one route of terror, recall our vote. So basically it tries to terrorize the process one after another until, until there's enough memory in the system. Uh, so we should, we should embrace the terror in this uh, particular case because, uh, you know, there is no other option actually. So um, what I say, what I'm saying is controversial. Well, there could be there could be reasons why your biggest process is not the best process to kill. It could be a critical process. But we've got we've got an exit exit route out of it. So in my case, there was no critical process that couldn't be killed. But in in case there is one, we've got a protect uh, protect shell utility and a proc control uh, system call. And those calls, then th this call can be used to protect the process from being killed by OM killers. So basically you can designate a process as being special, please don't kill me. But then you're on your own. If, you, if, if it's the biggest process and consumes the most memory, you may be out of luck. So in my case, I wasn't using the protect call. Um, so anyway, make job server detects when the process is killed and then it stops the job, and then it removes the um, artifacts that are on the file system but are unfinished. So basically the whole process is pretty much robust. You can kill processes without an issue because it's just the, the data that is corrupted is going to be removed on the disk. And in case, and then using, why you're using ZFS anyway, all your files are checksumed, so you don't have to worry about corruption that much. Uh, so the simplest solution was pretty much the best way uh, to do it. And the, the overall uh, result was that the system, even though I used full amount of memory, the system was always responsive because if I had to spawn a new SSH session and check if everything is all right, uh, guess what? Some protest was killed, but I could control the whole, um, the whole system. The system was always responsive to my commands. So that is very important. Uh, so the final run, uh, again, no surprises, which is a good thing, uh, as with the IT admins. Uh, so the make job server did the job. I had to occasionally log in, like after a night, you know, I was running the 
experiments overnight, then in the morning I would log in, see how many processes have been, have been killed, and try to rerun those processes, for instance. So occasional supervision was necessary, but well, that wasn't the issue. The, the whole experiment took me over a week, actually, of CPU time. Uh, I mean, a week of clock time, a CPU time, much more than that. So uh, and it ended up in a scientific article, uh, which, is, uh, which is on the slide. Uh, that was about surprise, surprise, estimating the memory consumption. So basically I was simulating the memory consumption of the hardware system, why I was actually, actually struggling with the memory consumption of, the, of my host system. So, you know, that is kind of ironic. Uh, and you can see in the HTOP screen for the whole, uh, for the whole uh, system here. So you can see that CPU load wasn't actually a challenge. It was memory load that was a challenge. And you can see the red red bars means that parts of the workload are, are actually is actually spent uh, in a system calls, not in a user space. And this is an indication that that was I/O calls basically. So the workload was, um, for instance, statistical pipeline was pretty much I/O bound. So what is the aftermath of this experiment? Well, there. Are quite a lot of good things as praises that we can say about the FreeBSD arm on ARM. So it's, a, it's pretty much a success story. It's been more than 10 years since the platform was uh, introduced to, to the FreeBSD ecosystem. And actually my company took a big part in it. Not me personally, but my colleagues. Um, and uh, it's a premier tier one platform. Basically, uh, I highly recommend it for any any of you hesitating um, because there are pretty interesting offers when it comes to ARM 64 servers. I remember when we first saw, you know, uh, let's say applied micro servers, uh, you know, in back in the early to uh, 2010s, uh, there wasn't really, you know, any alternative to Intel when it comes to performance. But nowadays it's completely different landscapes. You can find offerings which uh, we, can, we can find platforms that are actually better at some tasks than, than x86, both from Intel and AMD, including Gravington Free on Amazon. Mm. So it's a very good and reliable platform for scientific research, um, but we, we, we got to keep things simple. So I wasn't, so, you know, the ecosystem becomes much more complex than it used to be. And it means that there is a lot of challenge in maintaining that ecosystem. Uh, and the challenge must be solved with containers, basically. So um, you cannot avoid it, unfortunately. Uh, that was my, I learned by, uh, I learned the hard way. Uh, so there's a passage from the movie, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. If you work for a living, why do you kill yourself working? So basically, you know, my, um, my intention was to focus on science and leave the package management management for others, right? Because other people are good at it. I'm personally not very good at it. So uh, unfortunately I couldn't, you know, I had to do anything, everything manually, including compilation of the source code uh, from, from the scratch um, for some packages. So that was my, that was my bad, my, uh, my bad luck, I would say. And, you know, if more people become use Anaconda, you, if more people become more people become you know um, Python user or data science users uh, on FreeBSD, we can hope that Anaconda would you know make a move and start uh, supporting it, provided that they already support macOS, so they're not Linux only. They they also have it on Windows, so they should be multi-platform by default. Um, and we need to look for some decent images provided that provide all those data science software stacks because I feel sorry for anybody trying to repeat my uh, my adventure when it comes to this uh, uh, this Python issue actually. Uh, all right, so that is the end of my part. So if you guys want to shoot a question, then I'm not sure how much time is left. Not much, I think. But I'm ready to accept one or two.
Oh, okay. I, I can see that Alan is already praising ARM64 servers. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not my experience, not my experience only. Yeah, I can uh, I can I can conclude on uh, big knife comments that uh, all right. So there was a question. Okay, thank you. Okay, title of my thesis and the link to it. So yeah, that is a kind of uh, omission, I would say. So the title of thesis is actually. Let me go back with the slides. The title of the thesis is here on my slide. Uh, so this hardware acceleration of traffic classifier for high throughput Ethernet. Uh, and I can provide the link as well. Yeah, yeah, so the comments that I, you have to cut down the system on Warren to make jobs. Yeah, it's a, um, yeah, it's a common, uh, common issue. Uh, so let me just share the link to the thesis and we can call it day if there are no questions. Yeah, so I've pasted the link. Yeah, so Clang compiler, uh, by the way, Clang compiler is usually faster when it comes to compiling the code. So yeah, so it's a, it's a good choice. It's a good default choice for on FreeBSD. Um, Usually uh, it used to, uh, at least it used to have more warnings, like warning much more about stuff, which is preferable thing. And by the way, on Linux, if you if you comment on Linux uh, compared to FreeBSD, um, but the default switches for OM killer on Linux wouldn't work. So I was trying it actually, and usually what it's what happens is your desktop becomes desktop or server system becomes irresponsible. You cannot log in with a new SSH session, or you cannot open a window. Basically, you cannot type a command to kill the process, right? So it becomes uh, basically you're stuck. So basically you can see page swapping all the time. Um, so so I can think I can imagine that those issues could be tweaked if you're knowledgeable enough about uh, system control switches, about VM design in Linux. But the default setting wouldn't work. And the default setting on FreeBSD just works, which is fine. So perhaps it's too harsh for somebody, but I think we could, it is better than when, when the system is responsive, than when the system tries to keep the process, but it's not responsive at all. So I think that uh, that was a perfect choice. Yeah, so thanks about this uh, current SCAD preempt. Uh, I definitely check this out. So the question was, do I do I know a current of SCAD preempt threshold? So no, I don't, but uh, yeah, I'll check this out.
Yeah, so, so Linux is using some score, OOM score uh, heuristics, and this score is computed based on several factors. It could be altered also. So there is no, I think there is no protect equivalent, but there is a, uh, you, can, you can force the out of memory score to be, let's say more preferable for the process. Uh, and this way um, you can avoid in Linux now, there is, but there is no equivalent of protect as far as I know. And then in, in, uh, in FreeBSD kernel source code, you can see that there's just a one if which says, it, it, it says if the process has a protect flag, don't touch it, which is, you know, a risky thing. Uh, similar when you design, let's say real time system and you want to predict what's was the best priority of your process, then you may be wrong, actually. OK, I can't hear the whole, uh, can't hear it down, but. Uh, OK, so there is a, there is no thing, no activity on chat, I think. So should we call it a day? So thank you guys for your uh, attention and for for your questions. Uh, so you can see there is a um, more testimony of of uh, of the quality of ARM64 also on the chat. So um, yeah, see you to the, see you on the next conference.